My name is Alina, and I've been working with the cloud stack since 2009. Started as a part of the cloud.com, now continue developing as a part of Citrix. I've mainly worked with the API layer, network as a service of the VPC, and lately uh, I've been challenged to try on a different head and write a service on the top of a cloud stack. So that indeed has been a very interesting experience as a had to act as a third-party developer for the product where I'm a core developer. And certain things certainly backfired at me. <laughs> so today I'm gonna share this experience with you, as well as uh, give a brief overview of the DR infrastructure. Hope it would be useful for people thinking or writing the same services for the cloud stack. Oops. So what is the disaster in the cloud? The disaster is Basically, any failure that can happen to your data center, like the storage failure or the network failure, quarter router failure, or the physical damage. As a result, your entire data center becomes non-functional, or it can, host, can cause a partial data center failure. And the user VM, VMs become unresponsive. They cannot access their volumes anymore. They cannot stop. They cannot manipulate with VMs anymore. And any DR product's goal should be Prepare VMs for situations like this and recover as soon as possible. If you look at the cloud stack today and think about what possible solutions that can be used as a disaster recovery, there's only one feature, is recurrent snapshots. Basically, end user has to set up snapshot policies for his volumes and restore them either in the same zone or in the different zones. But you can't really call it out of the box DR solution as it just does the volumes recovery and any other data that is linked to your VM, like the network, the networking rules, you gotta restore it uh, by hand, either by calling the cloud stack APIs or by maintaining some set of scripts that do these calls for you. So all that created the demand for uh, the third party service. What are the advantages of using this service? First of all, it lets admin to configure the DR just by using the DR UI and APIs. You don't have to set up and maintain the, any extra scripts. It, can, it, pre it prepares the entire VM, including all the related metadata, like the network and networking rules. And when you restore a VM, you restore the entire package. It can recover VM cross zones. Uh, when it creates the recovery object, it does the real-time update for this object anytime anything changes for the original VM. It helps to keep the mean time to recover very low. It also provides a tiered DR service. If you think that some applications are more important than the others, you can choose to recover them first and charge based on that. There are some things that DR service doesn't cover. It doesn't do actual storage replication in version one. Storage replication has to be maintained outside of the cloud stack. It can be any third-party solutions like the NetApp Snap Mirror, or you can use a simple rsync. You can find certain advantages in this approach. Let's say a customer already used some uh, replication solutions prior to installing the DR. He can continue using it and just install the DR on top of it. Uh, we are planning to add support for storage replication in the next DR release. Very important questions, which version of cloud stack is supported by DR? The DR will work with the cloud stack 4.5 version, and it will work with the next Citrix cloud platform version that is based on 4.4 Apache release. Why such a difference? It's just because uh, some things it was too late to put to the uh, Apache 4.4 release. So we just put them into 4.5. While develop, while developing the product, I had to follow certain design principles. I had to develop the DR as a plugin in version one with the ability to run as a separate service in the future releases. So it means no changes should be done to the cloud stack core services packages that are just specific to the DR. And the DR dependencies on the cloud stack jars should be minimal. So, so far I'm using just Cloud API jar and cloud util jar. No direct access to the cloud stack database. No data manipulation through the database queries. All data should be requested and modified only using cloud stack APIs. 
DR service doesn't have its own database in version one. All the data that DR needs to use is stored in form of cloud stack metadata. In the cloud stack, every object like the user VM volume has a corresponding metadata table where you can store all third party details and you might choose if you want to show it to an end user or hide it from him. The feature was built around the fact that mean time between failures is very high because zone failures don't happen too often. So what it means for a cloud stack or for DR plugin, it means that uh, when you deploy VM in the original zone and the recovery object fails to create by some reason because something is misconfigured in the recovery zone, we never fail the original VM deployment. Uh, we always let admin go and fix things, then come back to the DR plugin and trigger the preparation again. On this picture, uh, I'm gonna show you how cloud stack deployment is done. So the cloud stack service consists of four parts, uh, DR UI plugin, API plugin, DR server, and DR events listener. On the installation, part is moved to appropriate cloud stack location. And as I already mentioned, it's gonna run as a part of the cloud stack process. So now I'm gonna show you how the, these parts communicate with each other. So all the calls to the DR services can, can be made either through the uh, DR API plugin, or there is also a DR events listener that listens to specific events happening on the cloud stack side, for example, VM deployment events or any changes that are done for the VM. Cloud stack publishes these events to the event bus and DR plugin listens to them and reports back to the DR service. So let's say something changed for the VM or the VM got deployed. DR service know, knows what to do, whether to deploy VM or to just update the recovery VM. And as I already mentioned, the DR service doesn't talk directly to the cloud stack orchestration engine. All the calls are done through the cloud stack APIs. The DR, DR process is logically split into four stages. Configuration is where you actually configure the DR service itself. Preparation is when VM gets prepared for failover. Failover is when VM gets recovered to the recovery zone, fell back when we move VM back to the original zone, once the zone is recovered. I'm gonna go through each, stages, through each stage in more details on the next slides. So what do you need to do to configure DR? First of all, of course, you have to link the active zone with the recovery zone. Then you gotta configure your DR offerings in the DR offerings, you can specify mean time to recover, for example, 24 hours or one hour, and you can charge your customer based on that. Also, you might wanna tag your storages so all your DR-enabled volumes can be placed in a certain storages only. Preparing VM for failover. You can trigger the preparation either by calling the API on the DR-enabled VM or you can use the, uh, or uh, you can listen to the events coming from the cloud stack and uh, react upon. Let's say the VM gets deployed from the DR enabled service offering, the DR service reacts and deploys the VM in the recovery zone. The recovery VM is nothing more than the metadata in the recovery zone. It doesn't occupy any physical resources. No volumes are created at this point no CPU memory resources are allocated, no networks are implemented. And the recovery VM metadata is invisible to an end user and he's definitely not being charged for that. All he can see is the VM in the original zone at this point. On this slide, I'm gonna show you how the preparation is actually being handled by the DR plugin. So the VM gets deployed in the active zone. It has just one nick. The DR service immediately picks up this event and creates the VM in the recovery zone. And let's say after some point, user decides to add his user VM in the active zone to another network and a new nick gets plugged to the user VM. DR service listens to this event 
and plugs the NIC in the recovery zone. So the failover, the disaster actually happened. How does DR plug in knows that something wrong happened to the, to the zone? There is no automatic indication of that. Basically, the DR plugin doesn't, doesn't know if, if anything goes, goes wrong in the, uh, in the original zone. Administrator has to monitor it and report to the DR service by invoking the certain API call to fill over the accounts VMs. All the DR service does is just prepares the uh, VM start in the recovery zone. On this slide, I'm going to show you how the failover process is being done. So here on the picture, you see active zone where the actual VM runs. It has two volumes on the cloud stack storage one. Storage represents the actual physical storage, physical storage one. And there is a data replication done from physical storage one to physical storage two by NetApp snap mirror. As you can see from the picture, there is no representation of physical storage two to the recovery zone. It, it hasn't been introduced to the cloud stack yet. So once the, once the uh, administrator triggers the failover process, the first step we do, we introduce the physical storage to the recovery zone. And all the volumes get discovered on the corresponding hypervisors. Then we connect these volumes to the VM metadata. So then what happens in the, to the VM in the active zone? In the VM in the active zone, we detach all the volumes. We don't destroy the VM. We just detach all the volumes and leave them around in case admin needs to access them. And then the VM in the active zone gets disabled and VM in the recovery zone gets started. And the next very important step, you could see that the VM in the active zone has an external UID one. We do the UID swap. So the UID, uh, the VM in the recovery zone will have the very same UID. Why do we need to do that? It's just because user relies on this UID to be the same cross zones. And all he can see during any period of time is just one VM having one UID. The only one information that changes is the recovery zone information. While DR is busy recovering user VM, the cloud stack administrator is busy recovering his zone from the failure. As soon as zone is back up, we advise to move the failed over VM back to its original zone. Why, why, why do we need to do that? Just think about it. Recovery zone can serve as a recovery for multiple zones in the cloud, and its resources are not unlimited. So you might, might want to spare them by moving VM back to the original zone. The fail back process is pretty similar to the failover process. The VM metadata is preserved in the original zone, and we're going to recover to that very same metadata. The only one new thing that we introduce, we reintroduce the volumes back from the recovery zone to the original zone. Why don't you use the original volumes? Just because customer might already uh, written something to the volumes in the recovery zone, and we have to respect this information. Then we do just the same. We disable the VM in the recovery zone, enable VM in the original zone, do the UID swap. On these slides, uh, there is, I'm, I'm going to show you some information that DR plugin stores in the cloud stack database in form of metadata details. So you can see there is a user VM table, and it has a user VM details table corresponding to it. What DR needs to know about is what object in the recovery zone is linked to this original VM. So it's a DR recovery ID. The state of the DR on this object, let's say something failed during the preparation. So we report back the failure. And the DR alert. So we generate the DR alert on per VM basis. So you can actually see the reason for the failure, why the preparation failed. All these details are being returned to the API caller. If you make the list virtual machine calls, you can see all the DR related information. Even the regular user can see it. He can see what's going on uh, with his VMs in terms of the DR. Sorry. Now, who controls the DR process? Who can do the configuration? Who can do the failover? Only root administrator is in charge of doing so. 
He creates the DR offerings. He can fail over the user VMs. All the user VM needs to do in order to enable the DR is just to start the VM from the DR enabled offering. Once the VM is started, he can, he can monitor. He can monitor the DR state of his VM. He can see whether it's been prepared for failover or failed over or failed back. <coughs> he can see the errors that happened during the DR, the alerts. He can, add, he can report back to the admin saying, oh, something went wrong with my VM. Uh, how do I fix it? We also show him the recovery zone information. He might want to know in which zone the VM is going to recover. And the last one is very important. We show the public the recovery public IP address information. Let's say prior to failover, uh, admin one, uh, user wants to configure his DNS with the active passive mode. In the active mode, he sets up uh, the public IP addresses in his original zone. In the passive mode, he sets up uh, the recovery IPs. Once VM is failed over, he can just flips the modes, and his web app can continue working the same way. Overall, it's been a pretty easy experience writing on top of a cloud stack, especially considering all the architectural enhancements that were done during the past two years. But there are certain things that I fixed on the cloud stack API side. First of all, some uh, data was missing in the Cloud Stack API responses. Like, for example, user data. You were able to set up user data using the API, but you couldn't retrieve the data through the APIs. Some resource details tables were missing for certain Cloud Stack resources. I've added it. There was no way for uh, Cloud Stack services to publish the alerts through the Cloud Stack APIs. I've added the API for that. There was no way to, monitor, uh, to manage the external UID. Basically, the UID the it was something that CloudStack uh, used to set for, for you. And there was no way to provide the UID during the VM deployment, for example. So we enabled that. There are some things in the CloudStack that are not granular <coughs> enough. For example, you, uh, when, you stop the v when you deploy the VM, you can postpone its start till the point you need it, or when you create a network, you, you, it's, not, it's not getting implemented right away. Uh, it gets implemented only when the first VM starts in it. For some resources, this behavior uh, wasn't exactly the same. Like for example, for VPC, at the moment VPC was created, we implemented it by starting the virtual router and occupying the IP resources. I've added the way to postpone the start. So basically you can create a VPC and postpone the start till the time you wanna actually add a network to this VPC. There are some things that are still missing on the cloud stack side. The very important feature, there is no single sign-on, and it made it a little bit difficult for services, communication from services to services. I had to use the secret key, API key, uh, signing, signing the request with them. And as I've already mentioned, the resource creation in the cloud stack and actual resource implementation is not granular enough. So that has to be fixed as well. So as a summary, I want to conclude, if, if you're a developer for any IS platform, CloudStack, for example, you, and whenever you develop a new API, you always have to think about, from the end user perspective, think about all the use cases, all the potential users that can use your feature, and build your APIs based on that. Also, look out which plugin services or bug fixes people do for your product. Sometimes they don't make it to the cloud stack, sometimes just a set of scripts maintained somewhere on the GitHub. It helps you to identify the gaps and uh, any missing pieces in your product. That's, that's it from my side. Have any questions? Uh, I, I'm cleaning late, so I might have missed it, but uh, in, to what extent does this, uh, the changes that you made to what extent are they usable for other code in CloudStack? For instance, the external UUID, I'm very interested. So all changes that I've made, I've made on the services layer, API layer. So basically it makes things easier for services integrating with the CloudStack. I didn't change any core code or <coughs> server code. So two questions. Uh, mm -hmm. You are replicating, so 
it's, it seems like you're replicating some content to the outside. Are you replicating the end user, so the user API keys and the user credentials? Of no, this is, these are uh, single cross zones. <coughs> we don't support cross-region DR in this release. And then one other part, uh, are you reserving the resources as you are? As I said, I don't reserve, there's no, no physical resources are occupied. And there are just two resources that we reserve. One is the public IP address for your network. And another one is the guest IP address for your VM. So no CPU, no memory. No CPU, no memory. So VM exists just as a metadata in the database. It doesn't actually start or create on the back end. We actually logically map the storages in the original and the recovery zone. So when you add a replicated storage to the recovery zone, we, we say, okay, the original storage for this is this one, right? And uh, basically when we rely on the fact that the path to the volume is gonna be the same, the VHD name is gonna be the same. And then on the hypervisor, it just does automatic discovery for these volumes. And we, all we need to do is update the metadata in the database, for the recovery volumes. So are there any hypervisor limitations for this, or is this? So in this release, we're going to support KVM, VMware, and Xen. Is the recovery zone, is it dedicated, or is it just any other zone you have? Excuse me, I can Is the recovery zone, is it, does it have to be dedicated and just sitting waiting, or is it just any other zone you have, you can then make that the recovery zone? You can make any zone. So the zone can, active, uh, can act as active and the recovery zone at the same time. And both, if you set up two zones, you can say, okay, zone two is a recovery zone for zone one, and zone one is a recovery zone for zone two. Yeah, sure. So if you've moved over to your recovery zone, and the user then creates a new virtual machine there, will you pick that up and take that back to their original zone afterwards, or do they have to? If you, uh, so if you deploy a new VM in the recovery zone, will We'll, uh, we can recover to the original zone only when this recovery zone is set with the recovery zone of the original zone. <laughs> only a, also any changes you make to the, your failed back VM in the recovery zone, they don't get reflected back to the original zone. Only volume changes we respect. Can I ask you to go back to the slide where you have the storage? I just wanna... You mean this one? Oh, you can see it? Sorry, let me play it. This one. So, so question on this. Why, maybe, maybe you could consider in the future, instead of using this whole physical storage replication part, all we can do is replicate the templates from one set, from one recovery to the other, and let the uh, puppet chef configure everything else. So, but it means, you, you, you mean that, uh, okay, when you replicate the template, how do you, how do you replicate all the changes that happen into the uh, so VM's volumes? Technically, data is never stored in the VM. Data is stored on some other no. location. I understand. So, uh, I mean, the, so the VM, the content is, is replicated through something else, not that, and we don't have to worry about NetApps, not there at all. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as the template is there, the metadata is there. When you power on the VM, Template is loaded, you know. Basically, you want to. Basically, you want to. You wanna, so basically, you want to. We don't have to worry about all that piece and stuff. No, yeah, I, no, IPs could be unique because. Basically, you want to. You want a physical storage to pre-exist in the recovery zone before the actual yeah, failover happens. This whole storage replication part. And what I'm thinking is, you know, the, the secondary storage replicates templates to the other recovery zone. That's what we're thinking about. Um, the storage replication might be covered in the next release. In this release, uh, we rely on the third-party solutions. Thank you.